Hello and welcome to today's Business Skills webcast, when self-doubt gets in the way of performance. Today is all about uncovering and helping you eliminate the imposter syndrome for you and the people you may coach or mentor. My name is Sarah Gonzalez and I would love to welcome our presenters for today. We have Performance Catalyst, Suzanne Mercia and Melissa Richardson from The Art of Mentoring. Welcome ladies, how are we today? Yeah, Thank you very much, very well. Thank you. We're all very excited to get into today's session. We've got a whole heap of people who have registered um, and we were talking earlier, Suzanne, about the whole impact of this imposter syndrome and how many of us may have experienced it but don't actually know what it's called. So let's get straight into everything we're going to talk about Great. and I'll hand over to you Melissa. Thanks Sarah. Um, so I just wanted to cover off the agenda so that we can give everyone that's watching today a bit of an idea of what we'll cover. It's primarily we'll, we'll hear from Suzanne, she's the ex real expert in imposter syndrome but I wanted to cover a little bit from a coaching and mentoring point of view, um, so that will, I'll bring my perspective on that. So we'll be touching on the importance of confidence and how self-confidence relates to the imposter syndrome, how important um, your mindset is in, in the background, and really it's all sourced in mindset, um, how and why this very interesting syndrome operates, um, Suzanne will talk through, you know, there are some differences between men and women and um, how they re relate with imposter syndrome. And then we'll move on to really how do you move beyond the grip of this thing so that you and your people um, can deliver on your potential. Because it really is something, um, if we move on to the next slide, so one too many, um, that I think should be understood by all coaches and mentors. How it came to my attention, if you like, is because um, as coaches and mentors, we all work with people that from time to time get in their own way. Um, and, you know, it's the role of the coach or the mentor to help them get out of their own way, if you like, because they're actually being a bit of an obstacle to themselves. So we need to help them sidestep themselves. Um, we were looking at some of the data from mentees that participate across all our mentoring program. And we have probably thousands of people participating in programs um, now. And we found that the biggest single benefit that is derived from a mentoring relationship is in fact self-confidence. So we started looking at that and also in the feedback that we were getting from mentees when we were talking to them, um, many of them talked about this idea of feeling like a fraud, feeling like any minute now they were going to be caught, um, how long will it be before somebody works out I shouldn't be in this job. Um, so I started exploring and looking at what's the psychological kind of underpinning of, of all of that and that's how I discovered Suzanne who really has become an expert in imposter syndrome. So I'm going to invite Suzanne to kick off now and really um, the first thing I think people would be interested to know is how did you get interested in imposter syndrome in the first place? Mm. Thanks Melissa. Um, uh, like a lot of things, I, I, my, my interest is actually started out very self-focused. About 20 years ago, I walked away from a pretty high-paying, high-powered role for all the wrong reasons. Uh, I had moved from fast-moving consumer goods marketing into advertising, and I, uh, I thought that the advertising side was the fun side. You know, we got to go to lunch, we got to do all those fabulous things, and, and um, unfortunately, I learned that wasn't quite the way that it was. So for the first 12 months, I worked pretty hard trying to figure out what, um, you know, how, how to actually um, you know, make, make this job work for me. How could I make, you know, make a significant contribution? Uh, and I attended an event at the end of the 12 months where one of the agency directors came up and, and said to me, um, Suzanne, how do you think you're going? And I said, oh, I'm not quite sure. And he said, no, you're right. Um, so that was not quite the answer I was hoping for. So back to the drawing board. And at the end of a further 12 months, I got a telephone call from the managing director of um, George Patterson Advertising, which is where I was working at the time. And, uh, and he called me up to his office. And I can remember the feeling that I had when I got that telephone call because I thought that I was going to get fired. So instead of taking the lifts, I actually took the stairs. And all the way up the stairs, I was trying to compose my face um, because in advertising, if you get fired, it's not very pretty. Um, they have two big burly security guards who walk with you to your desk and they give you a box and they watch you pack everything up and they frog march you off the property. And everybody knows what's going on. So all I could think about was um, walking up the stairs was, um, Suzanne, um, you know, be gracious, don't cry. So I got into Alex Hamill's office and I was sitting there waiting for him to get off the telephone, trying to compose my face. 
And he turned around and the first words out of his mouth were congratulations. And it was like, what? <laughs> That's so not what I was expecting. And he said, congratulations. And I said, but why? And he said, you're the first woman on the board of George Patterson Advertising. And I just looked at him. I was completely nonplussed. And I said, really? Why? <laughs> and he said, because of the contribution that you've made so far and the contribution you're going to make moving forward. And from my perspective, it was clear then they didn't have a clue that I did not know what was going on. So I sat on the board for a couple of years and for the entire time that I was there, I felt sure somebody was going to come along and say, hey, you, you're not supposed to be here. Pack your bags and go. So I beat them to it and I left um, and I started my own business. But the problem was I took the problem with me. Uh, and with the benefit of hindsight, which um, I, I acquired on, in this particular case about eight years ago when I started to look at the imposter syndrome, I realized that was what was going on for me. So um, when I walked away from there, apparently I was a role model for so many people and I had no clue. Uh, I didn't think I was doing a good job. I felt that um, there was no contribution that I was making. Uh, and apparently I was wrong. And, um, and learning about the imposter syndrome has helped me understand what was actually going on. So, so yes, I'd like to, um, to talk to you about the um, importance of mindset because um, that was, the imposter syndrome is a mindset. It's a limiting mindset. And um, essentially, um, when, when Henry, you know, Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right, he actually captured the essence of a mindset. And that's how um, we determine um, how we filter the world by the way that we perceive it. And we might see it as a positive place or a hostile place. We might see that um, uh, you know, we've got what it takes to be successful or we might, uh, we might not even recognize the capabilities and, and the successes that we achieve. Uh, because of the way that we see ourselves. So the imposter syndrome is a limiting mindset. I call it a case of mistaken identity. And the reason for that is that it's actually about how I see myself. Uh, and that's not accurate um, if we've experienced the imposter syndrome because it actually occurs to very successful people. And I'll talk about that in a bit more in a moment. Uh, but the feeling of not being good enough actually undermines our ability to perform, to perform to our potential. So that's why this is such a critical issue um, and why I've actually worked so hard to understand this and help my clients work through it. So as I said, it's a limiting mindset. But the thing that I think um, I really need to emphasize is it's actually the state of low self-esteem. People talk about confidence and absolutely confidence is the symptom, if you like, of what's going on. But it's called the state of low self-esteem. It's not the trait of low self-esteem, which is where I can't even get out of bed in the morning because I feel so bad about myself. Um, but this actually is um, something where we go, uh, we, we're feeling confident most of the time, and then we go into this state of not feeling good enough. Um, and there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of background as to why we might experience that. So the first one is that it's influenced by nature and developed through nurture. So scientists have discovered that more than 50% of our personality is actually formed by, uh, through our DNA. Uh, and so you look at the big five personality factors um, of um, agreeableness, extroversion, um, uh, openness, and then conscientious, conscientiousness and neuroticism. And those last two are loosely associated with the imposter syndrome. And conscientiousness is the ability to set goals, the ability to delay gratification, to be organized and ordered, um, and then um, uh, neuroticism is a degree of emotional reactivity that we might have and the, um, and the degree of anxiety and stress that we might experience. Nurture is um, whether we've been raised by perfectionist parents or caregivers uh, and we might have taken that on board, whether we were raised with criticism, often well-intentioned, and whether we were labelled as children because when, particularly in families where there's more than one child, um, there is a sense of... Um, uh, this one's the good girl, this one's the, the creative fellow, this one's the sporty one, and those labels we take on board. So it's latent until it's triggered by some external event that creates uncertainty, so something outside of us. And then we have an automatic and unconscious response because we, the last thing we want to feel is vulnerable. The last thing we want to do is, is um, uh, be seen as not good enough because that's our fear. Um, so we go into these self-protective behaviors, or we might go and take another course or read another book to try and improve um, our capabilities. But it's the self-protective behaviors that are the problem because um, they can often be um, more challenging than the actual experience itself. So then the trigger goes away and the reaction subsides. Uh, and so 
uh, when the reaction subsides, we may think that the imposter syndrome is gone. But what I'd like to do, uh, and we will talk a little bit more about that, is I'd just like to tell you where does this come from? Because it doesn't come out of the pages of Who Weekly. It isn't something I made up. It's actually a very rigorously researched um, phenomenon. Two psychologists um, named Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Eames, who taught at the university or at the state of, for the state of Georgia, actually identified it back in the late 1970s. And they were working with high-performing um, uh, PhD and um, master's students. Um, and they found that the women who were, and there were women at that stage um, of, the, of the research, uh, who were going for their final dissertations or exams were actually freaking out because they were thinking they were going to fail. Uh, and they thought this was quite puzzling because there was no reason for them to think that. They had been highly successful all the way through. Um, so they went back and investigated to see what was going on. And what they found was that around 70% of the people that they identified, um, uh, they, they researched, were actually experiencing the imposter syndrome. And around 30% of them experienced it at a pretty chronic level meaning it was almost like a pair of glasses that they wore around and looked at the world through. So um, that was pretty interesting um, research. And um, what they also um, later found was that uh, it was thought to be initially a women's syndrome, but they actually found that men experienced it as well. They just experienced it differently. So, um, and it's got a lot to do with the way that we're conditioned. So we may see some changes in this over time, but essentially women are still raised to be the, the, the ones who are responsible for the family. They're still the ones that, um, that have the children until there's a scientific breakthrough. I think that's going to continue. Uh, and often they're the ones that actually raise the children. Um, and so um, the men uh, are the ones who are conditioned to bring in the dollars because if they want to have a family, they need to be able to afford that. So men have a fear of failure. Uh, and please, this has got a gross generalization tag on it. So men have a fear of failure. And, and what they've learned uh, is to fake it till they make it, which is um, it ties into that whole um, piece of research that's been done around confidence, because confidence is perceived as competence. So a lot of times somebody will show up, a guy will show up and, and, and do, you know, be, be incredibly confident, and it will be assumed he's going to be equally competent. For women, they have a fear of failure, yes, but they also have a fear of success because in many cases they're, always, they're already doing a number of roles. They're taking care of the children, the house, often their parents. And if they're successful, something will have to give. So many of them back away for that reason, and, um, and so they fear success and failure. But the symptoms of the imposter syndrome are that they feel like a fake and a fraud. They focus on their weaknesses and their failures rather than their strengths and successes. They dismiss their talents, um, and if they do see them, because sometimes you do see them, you don't think it's actually um, that valuable. Uh, if I can do it and I feel like I'm not good enough, it can't exactly be rocket science. So that's how we dismiss, um, if, if we're in that space, um, our talents. If they're successful, they attribute it to good luck or somebody else's mistaken, um, mistakenly positive view of them or just being in the right place at the right time. So it comes down to a lack of ability to, um, to really um, uh, recognize what we bring and, and the value that we bring and, and um, to have that foundation of self-esteem. Fascinating. We might launch yeah. the poll now, Sarah. Yeah, so what we're going to do, we've gone through the symptoms and now we want to hear from you, our online audience. So we're going to quickly open a poll and we want to find out if you can relate to these symptoms. So um, just online, the poll's up, just select either the first response, which is yes, maybe somewhat, or then maybe no, and we'll actually have those live results come through and we'll be able to speak to them and then ask, ask Suzanne some more questions. And just as people are um, going through that poll and answering those questions, I think the whole idea of the difference between women, men and women, there's so much discussion around that, celebrating your own success these days. Do you mm. find it's more discussed now and more openly spoken about? Uh, in terms of um, uh, owning your success. Yeah, yeah, as females um, especially. Oh, look, I, as I said, that was a gross generalisation yep. and there are a lot of women who are very comfortable with mm. their value and the success that they bring and I think that's fantastic. Um, but I think that uh, it's more acceptable for women to be successful. The double, the, the, the unconscious bias and the double bind still come through. Yep. So um, where uh, a fellow um, might sort of put himself forward quite assertively, that's how he's seen as mm. assertive. But a woman can be seen as aggressive. So we've still got all of those sorts of things going on behind. And those labels don't help women yep. because they tend to... Um, show the symptoms of the imposter syndrome mm. more because they're not faking it till they make it. That doesn't feel comfortable for yep. them. 
So, um, yeah, I think, I think that it's certainly being discussed more. The imposter syndrome itself mm -hmm. is being discussed yeah. more, which I think is fabulous. Well, wasn't the CEO of Atlassian came out yes. and said he was a, a sufferer? He did indeed. Um, Mike Cannon Brooks was uh, was speaking at TEDx in Sydney, mm -hmm. and and he talked about all the um, the stages of growth for Atlassian and how he came up against his own mm -hmm. self doubt um, through all of those stages. So yes, it's definitely mm -hmm. being talked about a lot more. Mm -hmm. Uh, and entre entrepreneurial areas, um, any any time you're creative or any time the work that you're doing is put out in front of people, um, it creates that sense of vulnerability, and mm -hmm. and that's when we can experience the imposter syndrome. Great. We've also got a link to that in the resource library yes. as well. So if anyone wants to take a look at that, um, and the results have come through. I don't know what your expectations were here, Suzanne. So About seventy percent, yes. Seventy-three point eight percent. There you go. Um, Twenty-two percent, somewhat. Um, yes. So I think after this, I think it's this is great because it is something that you can apply, and maybe after we start to think about whether or not this might be you. And yes. now you're going to go into some, um, you know, of the yeah. repercussions. Um, but yeah, we've got three point two percent who said no as That's well. Fair. So, thank and, you. Yes, and maybe you're here to um, to identify the imposter syndrome and help people that work mm. around you. So, and, and it may be the case for those who experience it themselves as well. So, thank you. That's great, and um, and it's good to know the research stands firm. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so let's have a look then at the um, costs and consequences um, of self doubt. Um, so this is one of the reasons that Melissa and I have been talking about this for a while and um, and because it has significant impact on performance and and if the whole um, the whole thing about the imposter syndrome is that we actually do our best to stop anybody else recognizing that we feel like a fake and a fraud um, and so what it stops us from doing is putting ourselves out there with one exception but I'll talk about that so for employee engagement, for example, employee engagement is all about um, focusing on something bigger than ourselves. It's all about you know, being willing to um, make our unique contribution. It's about um, you know, sort of uh, really advocating the company and, and doing more, going over and above. If we're busy in, in, in a space of feeling not good enough, then we often will not engage. We'll keep ourselves separate. And the same thing applies to participating in team development. You know, teams go through that stage of forming, norming, storming, and performing. And, and storming requires people to be honest and to be, you know, to be open and vulnerable so they can find the rules of the team. And that doesn't happen when you feel that you're not good enough. Procrastination is another one. That is a big one. And that's one of the ways that coaches can tell or, or can, can identify somebody who might be experiencing the imposter syndrome. Because if we procrastinate, um, then we're delaying putting our work out there so other people don't have quite the same opportunity to have a comment on it or to, to judge it in the same way. Poor productivity because perfection might be driving me, and that's one of the um, the, the uh, indicators of the imposter syndrome. Um, so we're going over and over and over in things um, and not letting it go till we've done 120% of it. Ability to take feedback is all about feeling comfortable with who we are and not taking things personally. And unfortunately, when we're in that space of feeling like an imposter, that's not what happens. Um, willingness to participate in innovation. Well, uh, if any of you have been um, part of the brainstorming sessions that we used to have many, many years ago, I know it's quite different now. And they'd say, oh, well, you know, put your ideas out there and, and we'll all share and there's nothing that's wrong. Um, and some poor bunny does that and, and gets banged on the head for, you know, we've done that before, you don't need to worry about that and, and that sort of thing. So people will never participate again in that because it's making them vulnerable and making them feel stupid and open to judgment. Poor decision making, second guessing my decisions um, with self doubt, and and then prevaricating or, or just you know sort of flipping and, and not um, not moving forward in a firm way, needing to control things and micromanagement can come in under that space. So really wanting to make sure that everything is done precisely, so there are no surprises and therefore there's no uncertainty. Judging myself and others for not living up to a high set of standards, for example. And the one exception of pulling back is risky behavior. Now, <laughs> that on a Friday, if you talk about a Friday night, um, uh, that would be one thing, but we're talking about um, uh, in the workplace. And, and this is actually somebody who says, you know what, I do feel like an imposter, but I'm gonna go for it anyway. I'm just gonna go to the top. And you know what, they might not figure it out. Um, and I think that's probably uh, the case in, in, in many situations. So um, that's what that's what um, some of the costs and consequences mm. are of feeling like an imposter. And I think when we're working as coaches in the workplace, mm. we're really seeing this play out in lots of different scenarios. Absolutely, don't we? yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so, I want to talk now about how do you actually get beyond this syndrome? And it really is all about mindset. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
in our trainings with coaches and mentors, we talk about some simple things. Um, but I guess, you know, we don't want people to go out running around saying, oh, everybody, oh, you've got imposter syndrome. Yes. So <laughs> the first thing I'd suggest, and we'll have some links at the end, um, Suzanne does have a very good diagnostic that, um, that you can do or get your client to do that would help indicate whether they, they maybe are suffering from this. But then if you are working with someone who does seem to be suffering from some of these, some of the ideas that we had that um, coaches and mentors can use is firstly just help them examine their own mindset because it does come from the way you think. So look at the underlying assumptions, um, look at the underlying belief patterns and see how that might be affecting how the person is putting themselves out there in the world. Um, shine a light on their strengths and accomplishments because I think people with imposter syndrome focus very much on the negative and will mm. diminish their own accomplishments. Mm. And mm. The, a great role for a coach or a mentor is to actually you know, help somebody see some of the more positive things. Um, just tell them something simple. Tell them that you believe in them and that you're there for them because often people don't have that. Uh, in their lives. So, you know, having somebody that's a supporter that will help them through the difficult stages can be very important. And encouragement to try new things. So we, we talk about maybe getting beyond your comfort zone, but we don't want to push people too quickly. So it may be little by little that you're there to support them and encourage them to try a few different things. So if people who are watching today think they might have imposter syndrome um, or someone that they're working with can or maybe does, what can they do to be sure and what can they do about it, Suzanne? Sure. Um, this uh, the, it, sort of giving you a very, very quick rundown, as you can imagine, this is quite a complex issue, but this will actually get you started. So um, uh, really the first thing is to actually increase your awareness around it. Notice when you feel that you're not good enough and see if you can understand what brought that feeling about. So um, I use the term trigger. So what triggered that feeling? Um, and uh, because it, uh, the external event um, is, is subjective. So what might upset me might not upset somebody else. So it will be relating to you and a sensitivity that you have. So if you can understand that you're experiencing it and that there was a trigger that set it off, then you can have a look at what that trigger is and understand whether, um, you, uh, w whether that's a limiting belief or, or what's sitting behind that, and that's usually what it is. Um, then the second thing is that um, when we are in the space of feeling like imposters, we can be quite judgmental of ourselves and others. Um, and, and I don't know whether this relates to you, but certainly to me and I'm sure to many others, that we, we can be quite hard on ourselves and that's not terribly useful. So when we come across the imposter syndrome, it's not about saying, oh, I've done it again. It's actually about saying, well, that's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to what actually happened there. Uh, and when you're in more complex situations with other people or other, situ uh, other um, events, you can actually start to see what was yours um, to own and what was somebody else's and be curious about um, how you responded and how you might respond more resourcefully. The third one that I talk about is to build inner strength. And um, you touched on that, Melissa, when you talked about um, focusing on strengths. Uh, but it's also about um, uh, recognising, uh, building resilience uh, and you know, recognising that we, we go through stages in our life where you know, things are fabulous and then things are, at other times might not be. Uh, and what we need to do is really build that inner strength. So it's about optimism uh, and looking for the positive in situations that occur. Uh, if there's something terrible that happens at work, there's never anything that's completely terrible. There's always something that comes out of that um, that can be seen as positive. Um, so look for, look for the positives in those situations. I encourage my clients to start um, keeping journals so they can keep track of what happens. And there's a couple of things I get them to do. I get them to write down what they're grateful for um, every day. But the other thing I get them to do is actually focus at the end of the day on um, an external event. So, so it, 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 as you went through your day, what went brilliantly um, that you can do more of? Um, at what went quite well and how could you improve that? And what didn't go very well at all and what could you do instead of that? So all those kinds of things are actually building your feedback mechanisms and enabling you to, um, to really start to build that inner strength. It's also about developing an internal frame of reference or having an internal frame of reference check at least. Because when we're um, at the effect of what's going on outside us, we can be bounced around like corks on the ocean.
Stop comparing yourself to others. I mean, each of us has a different journey. Each of us has different set of circumstances, different experiences, different um, uh, different ways of perceiving things. And uh, so it's not terribly useful to compare yourself to others. The other part of that is that you're comparing the self that you see at three o'clock in the morning to the potentially the mask that somebody else is putting forward. You know, their best foot forward, they're faking it till they make it or whatever. So the comparison's not useful. Recognise your own strengths and successes, absolutely, and the value that they bring, and that's what Melissa was talking about early, earlier. What do they enable you to do that is of benefit to your clients um, or to your um, organisation? And consciously and consistently step outside your comfort zone uh, because that's where the magic happens. So, um, yeah. Mm, thanks, Great Suzanne. tips. <laughs> um, we're going to go to some questions now. We okay. have some coming through. So I'm also Great. going to um, advise people online to ask any question you like. It can be completely well, almost anonymous. any question. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, before we go into that, um, what can people do, just from the two of you? I think it's really great that we talk about things that we can do on our own. But what if we need that extra step and we want more help? Or, you know, like you said, it's really hard to fix everything into a 45-minute session. Yes. Mm. Where to next? Well, I, I can really recommend recommend reading Suzanne's book so we've got uh, we've got that on special on our website at the moment um, so I think that's worth doing yep um, there's also the free diagnostic which is available through Suzanne's website imposterhood.com so I think just learn more about it would be mm, the yeah. first um, piece of advice mm, absolutely um, I, I find that a lot of the articles that are around at the moment are great about raising uh, awareness it's, it's not that easy to find um, good, solid information. So um, my website certainly has that on there. Uh, and, and it's come through my experience. So I've had to work my way through this myself and as a coach and as a, um, uh, a marketing person and, and all those various things that, that I've done in my career, as we all have. Mm. Um, I, I've, I've, I've actually got, I think, a pretty um, interesting take on it because I look at the imposter syndrome as a mindset, but I also work quite closely to identify how that's showing up at work because we spend so much of our time there. Excellent. So we're going to go to some questions Lovely. now. Um, for those of you online who do have to leave, I want to thank you for joining. Um, yes, you will get a copy you. of the recording as well, but please complete the feedback before you leave because it does help us improve. And also take a look in the resource folder because there's some amazing information that Suzanne has passed me kind on. Sorry. <laughs> the one, other way around. Um, so first of all, we have a question. This is probably something I want to ask the both of you. So this mm -hmm. is from Dave. So in a mentoring capacity, once you recognise someone might have the imposter syndrome and they're in denial, what do you do about that? Do you give them Suzanne's book <laughs> as a little hint? Um, how, do you, how do you deal with those situations? Oh, look, you know, in mentoring, I love um, telling stories. Okay. So keep it at arm's length, perhaps, as a suggestion by telling a story about someone else you know yeah. that maybe and, and describe some of a the friend symptoms. Of a friend of a friend. A friend of a friend. And then let them step into the story for themselves okay. to mm. be able to say, ah, oh. now if you've already done that and they're still in denial, I don't think you want to push people or drag mm. people kicking no, and screaming. No so mm. I'd say tread carefully. Mm. Absolutely, I would agree. It's a, it, it can be quite a confrontational subject unless somebody's really ready to look at it. Mm. Um, so I would tread very carefully. Um, I've certainly, when I was first talking about this, because I speak on this, and when I first was speaking on this, I, I think if somebody had had some tomatoes, they would have thrown them at me because I was obviously not as delicate as I might have been because I was so excited. I figured out what I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, yes, very definitely tread carefully. Um, um, I uh, also um, create quite a safe space by telling my story yeah. so that they feel it's okay for them to own up to, okay, mm. yeah, I do that too. Yeah. yeah. So I find that quite useful. And I think in any case, some of the techniques I talked about before, you, you could use anyway. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, build it, trying to build their, their confidence yeah. and self-esteem yeah. by focusing on strength and telling yeah. them that you believe in them. And so you just don't put a label on them. Don't put case. a label yeah. on them. Yeah. Yep. And just going back, so if we go right back to the beginning when we um, spoke earlier, it seemed to be that um, there was a sense of, you know, sometimes Sometimes this is inherent in people when we speak about the nature versus nurture as yes. well. So a question that's lended itself to that nicely is once you've figured out that you've got this syndrome, maybe you've had it all along, does it actually go away? Or is it something that's with us for life, like a bad sort <laughs> of thing? <laughs> ask, me in, no. ask me in 10 years. <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I think what, what happens is that we become much more aware of what triggers us mm. and um, and then we, you know, we, we address those issues and they don't trigger us anymore. So yep. the, what, what bothered me five years ago is water off a duck's back now. Yeah. 
But um, you know, I think that what happens is it's it's, it's aligned with personal growth. Mm. You know, as human beings, we evolve. So um, you know, what what I was handled then leaves space for something else to come up for me to handle. Um, so uh, in my experience, um, it is a sensitivity that remains with us. But what triggers me is is nowhere near as as um, regular yeah. and and as um, as common, if you like, as as um, as it yeah, as it was back in the beginning. Mm. And also, just um, another, and this sort of talks to what you were speaking about about um, you know the repercussions. If you know when this does happen, how, what, how does it impact our life? And it's interesting how you speak about gratitude in the slide earlier. Um, we had a presenter who came on a few months ago, and she was speaking about wellness mm -hmm. and how important wellness is. And the same advice: mm -hmm. write something down that you're grateful for every single day. So, yes. could this impact us holistically if we don't? You know, not just in our work life when it comes to procrastination. Oh, How can it impact our mental health even? Is there sort of that element of it? Well, uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, the imposter syndrome is associated with neuroticism, mm -hmm. which not, not cause and effect, but an association. And that is the tendency to overreact emotionally, to okay. feel more anxious and stressed than others might. So that's, that's um, part of the setup. Um, but I think that, um, uh, I think definitely, you mm. know, I, th I think that... Um, I've totally lost track of the question. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Just our, um, the gratitude. our wellness the gratitude. Yeah, oh, yes, and the gratitude um, connection there. Um, yes, look, I, I think that what we're doing is rewiring our brain mm. and, and looking for the positive. And that also enables us to have a look at um, situations that might be perceived as negative and find something positive in there. So, yep. yeah, it's definitely looking at that. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, so we're almost at the end now, but just from the two of you, you know, we've spoken a lot about how um, people online can take this and apply it to their everyday lives. Top tips from the two of you, you know, what's the one thing that you really want people to take away today? Uh, me, do something about it if yeah. you're experiencing mm. it, because it, it comes and goes and the tendency when it's gone is to think it's gone, but it hasn't, it's just gone underground. Mm. Until the next time when you've got a big opportunity or something great comes up and it, and it, it can derail you. Mm. And, uh, and as I said earlier, it happens to people who are successful uh, and that's relative, but, but a success maybe that you didn't expect. Um, such as my situation, and uh, you know, it just derails you completely. Mm. Uh, and then you might get an opportunity and you might not make the most of it. So, yeah, um, that would be my advice. Great advice, mm. Melissa. And mine for coaches and mentors would, would simply be just learn more about it mm. so that you can actually be more effective in helping the clients that you work with. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you both. Thank it's you. been very enlightening to hear about this. Yeah. And like I said earlier, I think it's something that many of us have experienced in other people or ourselves, but now we know what it actually is. Mm. We know where to go to find more information about it. And we're much more educated after this 45 minute session. <laughs> thank so you. thank you everyone for joining. Thank, thank, you. thank you both uh, to Melissa Thanks. and Suzanne. Um, you. If you would like to find out information about the imposter syndrome and Suzanne's work, or maybe Melissa and her coaching um, and mentoring organization, please feel free to go uh, click on the links online and you'll be able to find it all there. Thank you once again, everyone, for joining. Uh, we hope to see you at future Business Skills events and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you.